If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to a very familiar passage. And we're going to talk today about the power of a father's love. The power of a father's love. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of Luke, the 15th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 11. I give you just a moment to get there. I want to, to remind everybody that SummerSlam is right around the corner, not this Wednesday. Hold on, let me look at my calendar here. Excuse me, this Wednesday, we will have our volunteers meeting during our, our fellowship dinner. So if you are going to be part of the volunteer group, I need you to be over there sometime between 6 and 6.20, uh, get you some feet real quick, and then we're going to go over the things that are going to happen. Because as you know, that means the very next week, SummerSlam. So remember that. Uh, remember Sister Ruby, um, uh, she's been in my mind a lot lately, and uh, I forgot to mention her, but uh, she is in recovery, but... Remember her. If you haven't gone by to see her in a while, if you haven't spoken to her in a while, please do so. She always loves being on the phone. She just doesn't like being on the phone a long time. She's going to talk to you for a moment. She's going to let you know what's going on. And then she's getting right back off the phone and going back to what she's doing. Sometimes, I, sometimes she does it to me and I'm like, wow, she doesn't like me that much. That's, that's, that's Miss Ruby. I love her to death. But just remember her that she, she's been down for a good while with a broken hip and just recovering from that. Just look around and those, like I said earlier, those that, that you have not seen in a while. We don't know why we haven't seen them. Have you, have you called them? Have you reached out to them? You need to. They might be hurting. They might need somebody to call them. They need somebody to show them love. If you have your Bibles, like I said, we're going to Luke 15. And this is what the scripture says. Starting verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to this said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many, not many days later, the young son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the, in the country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off. Somebody said a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And his son said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Father, I pray as we go into the next few minutes, Father, that you would arrest our minds and our hearts and our spirits. That we would hear your words and we would allow them to penetrate deep into who we are. Father, anoint me to speak only what you have placed in my heart. Anoint me to speak only what you want me to say. And Father, I pray that your will will be done. Father, we will leave victorious because your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Your word will not come back to you void, but it will accomplish everything that you purposed it. We love you and we thank you in Christ's name. Like I said, today we're going to talk about the power of a father's love. Uh, I was going to read this, but I'm not going to just, just for time's sake. But if you didn't get a bulletin, we, I found a very funny uh, top ten list. You, if you ever watched David Letterman, he always had the top ten list. And it was always kind of silly. And this top 10 list says the top 10 things you'll never hear your dad say. Now, I, I would ask you to read that in your leisure time and just add, and tell me, are those something that your dad would never say? Because I guarantee you, these are every one of these my dad would never, ever say. And so it's just supposed to bring a little, little humor to your life. But, but as we go into our, our scriptures, we, we read a story that we have heard many, many times. 
We, this is a story that has been preached probably every way you can think of. But when I begin to, to think about today, and I begin to say, God, what do you want today? Well, what, this scripture just dropped into my spirit. I was like, but this, this I, I don't really understand. And as he dropped into my spirit, he began to, to move me in a different way. And so hopefully today I will do it justice. But today we will talk about the power of our Father's love. And we're going to break the scripture down. If you, if you look at the first couple verses, it says, to illustrate this point further, this is the new living. It said, Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons. A younger son told his father, I want to share, I want my share of your estate before you die. So his father agreed and divided his wealth between the sons. When we begin to look at this, there's certain things that we have to do when we read. And I've, I've kind of alluded to this sometimes. That sometimes as we read the stories and the scriptures, sometimes we don't add to it. But we allow our minds to see what's really going on in the story. Sometimes there's things that are not actually written, written in the story. But we know those things happen because of the way the story kind of runs its, runs its course. And so as we begin to see this, we don't understand the father within the story. We don't understand what the father did. We don't understand what the father had. All we do know is he had property. He had an estate. He had hired servants. And he was going to give this to his kids when he passed. His father prepared for his children so his children would have what they needed. The father knew his children were going to need something in life. And because of that, he prepared for that time. The father had prepared an inheritance. Do you have an inheritance? Some of us might have an inheritance. Once our, our family, somebody dies, our uncle dies, or our grandfather dies, or, or a parent, we have an inheritance coming to us. I would like to say that every one of us has an inheritance that we're going to get one day if we live the life that Jesus Christ is calling us to live. Because he says that he has an inheritance that we will inherit once he comes back. Once we cross over that line of eternity, we're going to get the inheritance that he has for us. But the father here had an inheritance for his kids. His children were well taken care of. Sometimes I kind of look at them and I think, well, they're kind of brats. You ever been around some bratty kids? You know, their mom and dad gave them absolutely everything. And because of that, they never respected anything and they become brats. You, you ever see that? But you, you have a child that has to work for this and has to work for that. They take better care. They, there's more respect that comes from them because of how they have to get certain things. Obviously, one of these kids, I believe, was a brat. It was the younger one because he wanted his stuff now. But the father was preparing to bless his children at the right time. At the right time, the father was preparing to bless his children. But while he was preparing that, he was providing for them until that time came. You see, sometimes we get to the place to where we want what we want and we want it now, but you're not ready for what you really want. You can't deal with what you really want. You think you can. And because of that, God is preparing something for you, but he's not going to give it to you yet. But until he gives it to you, he is providing the things in life that you need to prepare you to receive what he's going to give. The father was doing just that. The father was preparing everything that he could for his kids. The father or his father had provided all that he need, yet it was not good enough. He wanted what he wanted now. So then you go to the next verse, verse 13, and it says this. A few days later, the younger son packed all of his belongings, and he moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. That could be a day, because if you're really wild, you can waste everything that you have in the blink of an eye. It says, but about, about the time that his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. Sometimes the decisions that we make are not the best. You ever made a mistake? You ever... You ever was just going straight forward as fast as you possibly can because you knew God was saying this. And then before you realize, you're like, wait a second, I'm, maybe that wasn't the best thing for me to do. Maybe I needed to slow my roll just a little bit. Sometimes it's hard for us to slow our roll because once we get going downhill, we don't know how to do that. The young man was just like that. Sometimes our decisions are spontaneous and impulsive. Sometimes 
We just want it because we want it, because it looks good, because it's pretty, it smells good. Everybody else got it. I want it. I'm just going to do what I want to do. I'm not even going to think about it. And about 30 minutes after you made that decision, you're like, why in the world did I just do what I just did? I do not understand what I'm doing. Because we're not waiting to allow God to move on us. But yet, we, we are moving in an impulsive way. And we're making decisions that we shouldn't make. Sometimes the decisions that we make drive us and carry us far away from those that love us and have proven themselves to us. You ever found yourself on an island? You ever found yourself making decisions and doing things and people aren't, aren't, aren't really on board with it? They're trying to say, no, you don't need to do that. No, you don't need to do that. Before you realize it, you're looking and you're still at the same place. You're still on the estate. You're still doing your business and handling your business. But as you begin to look around, the person that was making that decision is no longer with you. That, that person is far away because, because they're beginning to drive themselves away because of the decisions that they're making. That he's still, the father was still on the estate. The father was still in the same place that he was when he gave his younger son his inheritance. The father has not left. The father has not moved. The father has not put up new locks. You know, the first thing you do when you buy a new house is change the locks, right? You sign your name on the paper, about 500 pages. You go to Home Depot, you get your, uh, a lock kit. You go and you change the locks and say, this is mine. You can't get back in. The father didn't do that. Everything was the exact same, but yet the son was far away. It was not because that he, was, he wanted to hurt them. The son didn't really want to hurt the father. It was, it was time. You ever had that conversation with your child? Obviously, I hadn't yet. My oldest is 11. If I do... We'll have different words. It's time, Daddy. No, I think what time it is. But if you had those conversations with your children, maybe maybe you had those conversations with friends or relatives, somebody close to you that you know are about to make the biggest mistake of their life, and you're trying to say, no, no, it's not time yet. You need to wait. You need to think this out, pray this out. Let's let's go ask some 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 good counsel. Let's let's find out what we really need to do. No, it's time. It's time for me to go. And they begin to go, and then, then they find out that they're by themselves. We end up in a place that we don't belong. This young man had everything that he needed in life. This young man did not want for anything. He had servants waiting on him hand and foot. He had what everybody else wanted, but yet he wanted to go do what he wanted to do. And the scripture tells us that he went off and he wasted all of his money. Everything that his father gave him. Everything that his father blessed him with. Now that might hit somebody in a second. Everything that the father blessed him with, I wasted because of the decisions that I made. And I didn't take better care of what the father gave me. And because of that, now I find myself in a foreign land, in a famine, starving to death. Because I didn't take better care of what the father gave me. It's going to be a quiet day today. That's okay. Next week, I'm going to open up a side business. I'm going to start selling steel toe shoes out in the front. It's going to be millions. <laughs> millions. But he wasted. He looked around. He had everything that he needed. Then he looked around and says, where am I at? Everything that God gives you sometimes, you waste it because you think you know better than the Heavenly Father. Everything that you, you've been given and been entrusted with, you waste it because, let's, let's, frankly, let's, let's be honest, sometimes we're just lazy. We're lazy and we don't want that. We want it, but we don't want the responsibility. And because of that, we begin to waste it. And as we begin to waste it, we begin to find ourselves starving in, in a place where there's a famine. There's really not a famine. The Father can bring down manna in the desert. He can bring down manna right there. But we place ourselves in a place to where we're not willing to receive what the Father has for us. And because of that, we starve. And we're starving ourselves because we choose to. But God has more for us if we allow Him the place that He wants to be in our life. We're in a place that was not made for us. The Father made an estate. He had property. He had things that He made. He cultivated. He made it for His children to be a part of. And when he passed, when he went away, this was going to be where they was going to be able to live. They was going to be able to do anything that they wanted. They was going to be able to sustain themselves by what the Father gave them. But so many times, we take what the Father gives us and we leave and go our own way. We leave and go to our own place. 
And as we go to our own place, we begin to find out we really didn't know where we were going or what we were doing. Sometimes the decisions are made against you. You might be the father. You might be the mother that, that, that gave everything that you possibly could to your child or, or to somebody that you're raising. And they made decisions that hurt your heart, that hurt your spirit. You still have trouble sleeping at night by some of the things that they said and some of the things that they did and, and the things that they took from you. I'm not talking about the, the, the physical possessions, but they took a part of your inside. They took a part of your heart. And because they took that and they, and they mistreated it, now you can't sleep at night. You can't deal. You, you can't trust because of how they did. Sometimes those decisions are made against us. We don't know why because we've given them everything. I could just see that father says, here, you can have everything. This is exactly what I owe you. This is what I was going to give you. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you just a little bit more. And as I give it to you, do whatever you want to with it. And that's exactly what he did. And he wasted every bit of it. You have to live and deal with the thought of this, that all you provided was not good enough. Ever had those arguments with your children? You, you buy them a new toy, or you buy them a new electronics, or they, you give them this, or you give them that. And within two or three weeks, they break it because they're just being silly or just being disrespectful to it. And you're saying, you did not take care of what I gave you. You did not respect it. You did not honor what I've given you. You broke it. Sometimes I think God looks down on us and he says, I've given them so much. But they break what I give them because they don't really respect it. Because they think they deserve it. They think it is owed to them. This younger boy knew. This younger boy knew that he was going to a place. He knew what he was going to do when he went to that place. He already had it planned out. And as he got there, his plans didn't go quite according. As it was written on his book. He had his calendar out. He was writing this, writing that. Then he had to start erasing it because now he had nothing else to give. And he found himself alone in a, in a foreign land. Nothing to eat. Nobody to care for him. Nobody to help him. Completely alone. Verse 15 said, And he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods that he was feeding to the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When you begin to look at this, and you begin to understand the history and the tradition of the Hebrew people, we understand that the pigs were unclean animals. Pigs were things that, that you could not be around. Pigs were not things that you could sacrifice. You were not supposed to touch them or eat them or anything like that. They were, they were not supposed to be part of your life. And because of that, this this boy got, found himself in a place to where he squandered everything that his father gave him. And now he finds himself in a place to where he is not supposed to be hanging out with the things that he was not supposed to hang out with, about to touch and, and get to where he was not supposed to be. He was about to begin to eat the things that were keeping the detestable things alive that he was not supposed to be. The things that were, that were giving those things that were not supposed to be in his life, the things that were giving them strength, he was about to begin to partake of them. He was about to begin to eat of those things. And I begin to ask you this, those things that you're trying to, to pull out of your life, those things you're trying to push out of your life, are you eating the fuel that you're trying to give them instead of giving it to them? Because if you are, you're not pushing those things out, but you're bringing it deeper and deeper inside your spirit. And as you're bringing it deeper and deeper inside your spirit, you're going to find yourself in the desert, in a far land, starving to where nobody will be able to help you. Are you eating the fuel that you're really supposed to destroy? Sometimes the decisions that we make take us lower than we've ever been. You know the old saying, sin's going to take everything from you, right? It's going, to, it's going to cost more than you thought it was going to cost. It's going to keep you longer than it's going to cost you. You know, you know the saying, you know, to where sin is, going to, as you begin to go down that path, you begin to realize that it's not that easy coming back because as you're coming back, you're going against the, the current. And as you're going to, I don't know if you ever paddled against the current. Anybody ever paddled against the current? I remember as a, as a, as a, a when me and Becca were dating, 
my youth group back home in Augusta, we went down the, the Savannah River, and as we and in canoes, and as we was going down the Savannah River, there's supposed to be a little drop-off site. We went off to the right, and they had this, the, the, the ropes and things you can dive off into the lake, into the river. And so we was having a good old time. And we were just paddling, and it was splashing water on each other. You know, it was all fun. The water was kind of chilly. And we get going, and we get going, and, and as we get going, it's like, man, when is this place going to come? And then we come to find out we, we, we paddled about half a mile past where we were supposed to be. And as we was going out, we was going with the current. So now we have to paddle half a mile back against the current. Now, if you've never paddled against the current, I want to encourage you to do so. You will feel the burn. We all want to feel the burn, right? You will definitely sleep well that night if you can lift your hands up and put them where they need to be because before you realize, your arms are going to be just, you're going to wish that you just cut them off. But we, we, we paddled back. Well, I could say I paddled back, pulled a little back. And she, at that time, she would she paddle a little bit, and then she would just sit there. She would shake her arms off. But it, it's hard going against the current. And once we begin to make those decisions to get away from God, get away from His calling, to get away from His anointing, it's a lot harder to get back to what He has asked us to do. You might not agree with it. You might not believe it. But I'm telling you, once you get to that place, it's harder to get back. We've been talking about some people that have, that have kind of left the church, some, some younger people. And we begin to think, you know what? I, I wonder why they don't come back to church. And they're saying, you know what? They're probably just afraid of what people are going to say about them. They're probably just afraid. That's like, no, what, what, what the problem is is this. If they understand as soon as they come back into this church with an open heart, they understand that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to hit them. And then they understand that when that conviction hits their heart because it was there before. And as the conviction hits their heart, they're not going to be able to turn it away. And they're going to have to re receive and, re and respond to the drawing of the Holy Spirit. And they understand once that happens, everything else that they had laid out in their life, once they left the church, they're going to have to cut off. They're not willing to cut it off. They're not willing to come back upstream to where God is sitting there waiting. God has not moved. No matter where we are in life, God is still right where He was, sitting on His throne, waiting for His children to accept His Son. He is sitting right there waiting. He's not hiding. He's not playing peekaboo. He's not changing His address. He's not blocking you from Instagram. Uh, he's, not, he's not hitting you up on Snapchat or something silly and then blocking you so you can't respond. He is right where He was when He called you that very first time. Sometimes the places that we go and the things that we do are not us. But the circumstances have taken control and ripped away our identity. I guarantee you, some of you can look back at your life. I can do it. I can look back at my life and I can say, you know, when I was living this life and I was doing this, that was not who I was. I was raised different. I knew better. I was, I was raised a different way. But yet because I was unwilling to come out of that, I started becoming something that I was not made for. I started becoming something I was not created to be. But it took something to pull me out of that. I was in a place unfamiliar within my spirit. In a place unfamiliar with what was going on in life. I was so far from God. I was like, well, I don't think God's even there. He's not even answering my prayers no more. But then there was that faithful night that I spoke about. That faithful night where I began to listen yet again to the call of God as He started pulling my heart. I began to understand that I was starving myself. He was there dropping manna in my life every day. Every day He was dropping something in my life so I would have the strength to make the right decision. So I'd have the strength to do the things that He wanted me to do. The love of a father is powerful. I could just see the boy thinking that this was the worst assist thing that he could ever do. Touch these pigs. Eat the food of these pigs. Do the thing that I was told never to do. These are things that if they happen, there's no coming back from. Some of you are sitting here right now thinking, well, there's really no coming back from the things that I've done. I'm going to come. I'm going to be faithful. I'll give my tithes. I'll do this. I'll do that. But there's really, you don't really understand what I've done. There's no coming back 
from that. And you live a life of starvation. You live a life not allowing God to touch you. Here we find a young man doing the one thing he said that he would never do. Here we, he is in a place now that he would never be able to be reached by God. He is now looking at that and is thinking, what would the Father think of me now if he could only see me? What would the Father think of me? He hit rock bottom. Have you hit rock bottom yet? Like they say, sometimes until you do hit rock bottom, you're never going to be able to stand back up because there's still room to go down. But once you go all the way down, there's nobody else, nowhere else to go. You understand there's only one place to go. You're already at rock bottom. You're already on your knees. All you got to do is turn your eyes upward. And as you turn your eyes upward, you begin to understand that the Father is still there. The Father is still looking and the Father is still caring for you. He is still loving you. The power of His love has never turned away from you. But nowhere in Scripture, as you begin to read this about the prodigal son, nowhere in the Scripture, in this story, can we see the father turning away from his son. We see what the boy did. We see how he lived. We see the, the decisions that he made. We see how he squandered everything. But then when it goes back to the father, the father is, like, is right there on the estate when the boy left. He has not left. He is still right there waiting. He's not writing him off. He's not throwing his hands up and surrender. You ever done that? Talking to somebody, you know, you could be a, a family member, could be a brother, sister, could be a friend. Oh, forget it. I quit. I, I'm just not, I'm not talking to you no more. You're just not listening. I quit. I quit. And we throw our hands up and surrender. What would happen if God looked at you and said, Pastor Jose, I quit. You're not, li I quit. You're not listening to me. You're on your own. I quit. Words that you would never hear your father say. He would never quit on you. He would never turn from you. He would never leave you by yourself. The Bible tells us that the righteous, he's never seen anybody, any of the righteous begging for bread. The Bible tells us that he is always there ready for us to come back to him. Always there ready to provide, ready to protect, ready to love, and ready to accept. He is always there. My question to you is are you willing to accept what he is going to give you? Because sometimes that means you've got to swim up current. He has given his child space to find his way. I'm not looking forward to that. It's coming. But God is not a totalitarian God. He is not a God that is authoritative saying you do this or that. God is a gracious God and says I'm not going to force you. You have free will. You have the abilities to make your own decisions. And as you make your own decisions, understand if you decide against the things that I'm asking and place it in your spirit, you're going to reap the consequences of those decisions. But that's okay. Reap those consequences. And as you do, I will still be here waiting for you when you realize those decisions were the wrong ones. I will be here with open arms waiting for you to come back to me. That's the God that we serve. That's the Father that is sitting on the throne looking down at us right now, understanding that there are some people needing His touch in their life. He gave his children room to breathe. He gave his children over to their own decisions. And then we find in verse 17, it says, when he finally came to a census, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. Not to eat, to spare. The hired servants had enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, now, I'm going to preface this because every one of us have done something to grieve God. And when we've done that, we say, you know what? Well, if I come to him like this, it'd be okay. I'm, I'm going to let him know I don't need everything, just a, just, just a little bit. It says, Father, I have sinned against both you, both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as your hired servant. God, I don't need everything that you promised me. God, I don't need the calling, the anointing, and the presence. I just need you to provide enough for me to continue living. And this is, this is the, the, God, the boy's reasoning. If I say this, the father will take me back. 
And some of us have gotten to the place to where we've eaten so much pig, we've eaten so much of the, of the pods that we've given the pig, and got so much of that de- deplorable stuff inside of our spirit. We tell God, you know what, if you just give me enough to live, I don't need everything else that you have promised me within your word. But it, I don't need it all, just enough so I know that I will be able to live. But here we are. He was lower than he's ever been in life. He was focused on himself that he forgot about the love that gave him the ability to be in the place that he was in in the first place. He forgot about the blessing that the Father had given him that gave him the decisions to go to this foreign land and to waste everything that he had. He forgot that his father did not argue. I don't know about you, but as I read this in different translations, I never found anywhere in here where the father argued with him about the inheritance that he wanted at that time. The boy went up to the father and says, I want what is mine. The father says, here. Tell me where he argued. Tell me where he was disagreeing with the son. Tell me where where he was trying to tell the son, no, 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 no. Not yet. You're not ready. I was putting this aside for when I died. He was lower. He was so focused on himself that he forgot about what the father had given him. He had lost sight of that love and that support. Even though he had lost sight, and even though that he was focused on himself, even though he was in a place that his father would not agree with, he knew his father's love. He knew that if he went back, even though he was going to try to coerce him, saying, I don't need to be your son, I will be your hired hand. He knew that the heart of his father was so big that his father was going to open the doors wide open and say, come on in. Some of you need to understand that no matter what you've done, the Father, when you ask, He's going to open those doors wide open and say, come back into my estate. Come back into what I have already prepared for you. You might have wasted in the blessing that I have given you, but it doesn't matter. I have more here than I've already been preparing for when you came back. The Father is not taken by surprise when we make decisions that's going to push Him to the wayside. People need to remember the love of the Father. Do the people around you know your love? We are the hands and feet of the Father. (laughs) This song has got these little catchy tunes and it's been on the radio uh, 48 years, I don't know. But it's one of those songs that's kind of cool the first three times you hear it and you're like, please take this off rotation. But it's the ones that he says, you know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And the song says, well, I created you. You probably know the song that I'm talking about. But that's what he said. God created us to show other people the love that he has. And so my question to you is, do they see your love? When they see your love, do they see a stipulation attached to that? Do the people around you know that you're there? Or when they look at you, they say, ah, it's kind of hard to get with that person. It's kind of hard. Are you there? Or are you washing your hands from the mistakes they've made in your life and the hurt they've already caused? I don't think anybody on this earth will make the mistakes against us that we've made against the Father. And yet He never washes His hands with He never pushes us to the side and says, you're damaged goods. We don't need you. You're not even worthy to be my servant. You just get over there into the the famine and starve. You would never hear your father say that. The young man knew that should be the case. He deserved to be abandoned. He deserved what he got. He deserved to be alone with all that he has done and the way he treated his father and the blessings. But he could not shake the love of the Father. He could not hide from it. Jeremiah 31 and 3. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. Psalms 139 and 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? And where where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Shiloh, you are there. It makes no difference where you go and the decisions that you made. The love of God is going to reach you wherever you are. 
And because His love can come through anything and cut cut through everything that you've ever done, you will never be alone if you open up your heart and allow Him a place that He wants. You cannot flee from Him. You cannot hide from Him. Go into the darkness. His presence is right there. It says making the darkness as new time to Him. No matter where you go, you can try to hide. He is right there hiding with you. What are we hiding from? I got your back. Don't worry about it. You might not be making the right decisions, but I'm going to hide right here with you because you're going to need me at a time. And when you do, I'm going to stand up and show you that I've always been here. No matter what you think you're going through, no matter what you think you've done, I will be here because of the love of the Father. We're never alone. We're never alone because of His love. In the back of his mind, he knew the Father was there. But he didn't deserve to be in his Father's presence because of how he treated what his Father gave him. Verse 20. So he returned to his Father's home. And while he was still, still a long way off, while he was still a long way off, his Father saw him coming. I don't care how smelly you are. I don't care how how deplorable you think you are. I don't care how bad you think you are. When you begin to say, you know what? It's time to go to daddy's house. It's time to, and I'm going to begin to walk towards daddy's house. And as you begin to walk towards daddy's house, something in the air changes. And daddy says, my child is coming back to me. My child is coming. He can feel the, your heart. He can feel what you need in life. And as he sees that, and as he, it goes on to say, Filled with love and compassion. Filled with love and compassion. I know he wasted everything I gave him. I know he went out there and made my name deplorable upon everybody else. I know he just made everybody sickness with all that he did. But filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. It didn't matter what he did and what he wasted. He ran to where his son was. He's not going to wait for you to get all the way to where he is. Because once he sees you're coming. And he knows you're meaning it. He's going to meet you right where you need to be. He's going to stand up right where you are. And he's going to say come here son. Come here daughter. Come here let me show you the love that I have. It's never been gone. I've never left you. I've never forsaken you. My compassion is bigger than anything that you can go through. His son didn't need to be there. His son should have died in the desert in a foreign land. But something brought him back to his daddy. And as he brought him back to his daddy, his daddy saw him and he says, I created him in the image of myself. And because of that, I am going to love him beyond all things. And as he's coming back to me, I'm going to run. I'm going to meet him in the middle of the road. And I'm going to show him the love that I have for him. Where are you at? What road are you on? Pastor, I'm saved. Pastor, I got everything right. I'm I'm okay. Really? Really? That's fine. You can be saved, but you can be saved and still running. You can be Jonah was a prophet. He could hear from God. He could he talked to God and he still ran. But when but when God got his attention and he gave himself back over to God, God worked a miracle through him and saved the land. Are you running from God? Are you running from what God is asking you to do? The power of a father's love can change everything. The Bible says that his love never fails. His love never wanes. His love is stronger and bigger than any obstacle that we could ever place in our path. John 10, 28. This is powerful. I want you to hear this. It says this. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me. And he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Jesus saying, I am the same as the Father. We are one. We are the same thing. We are are in this thing together. And he has placed them in my hand. And as they have placed in my hand, 
they nobody is strong enough to pull them out of my hand. I don't even have to try. I can stand there with my hand wide open. No matter what decision you made, no matter how strong the devil is that's coming against you, he didn't even got to flinch a muscle, and he's right there because nobody. But you can you can get up and you can jump out this hand. You can get up and make a decision that I'm going over. I'm going over here, but nobody can snatch you out of the hand of the Father. As many dumb things as I did in my life, I'm glad my dad never turned his back on me. I told some stories yesterday in the breakfast. We won't repeat some of them stories, but there were things that I did to my dad. There were things that decisions that I made growing up as a, as a young man that knew it all, kind of like this guy here. That my dad just said, you know what, dummy, you just do what you got to do. He never did. He always had my back. Was he disappointed at me? at some? Absolutely. If you knew some of the decisions that I made, you'd be disappointed in me too. But he never turned his back. He never wrote me off. He never threw his hand. Well, sometimes he threw his hands up so he wouldn't smack me in the head. That big dummy, I don't know what he's thinking this time. But he never turned away from me. Your Heavenly Father, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you are. I don't care how bad you feel about yourself. Your Heavenly Father has never turned away from you. Your Heavenly Father has never written you off. He has never pushed you to the side. But he is drawing you to himself. It doesn't matter what trough you have put your hands in. It doesn't matter what mess your mind has wandered to and took control. It doesn't matter that you've wasted your gift and your blessings that the Father gave you. His love is strong. The love of the Father is greater than any slip, than any fall, than any failure, than any decision that you made against him. His love parts the clouds of confusion. Because the boy was confused. He didn't know what to do. Well, maybe I can just come and be a, be a, a hired hand, a servant. He didn't understand what was going to happen. But, but it goes on to say that, that the, the father met him in the middle of the road and wrapped his arms around him. He says, you know, my dad's got a big heart. But I've never seen him treat the hired servants like this. He never hugged them and kissed them. He gave them something to eat. But he, he wrapped his arms around me. And is telling me that he is accepting me as I am. And that's how God is trying to tell you. He is accepting you exactly the way that you are. The Bible tells us in verse 21, he said, The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He could not receive the love of his father. And so many times we feel so bad about the things that we've done against God. We reject His love because we're not worthy to accept it. We're not worthy to walk in the blessings. We're not worthy to walk in the anointing. We're not worthy to walk in the acceptance that is Jesus Christ. He was tainted. He was broken. He was not worthy enough to be called His child. He just wanted to be back with something in His belly. Wanted to know that he was going to be okay. Sometimes we come to church. It might hurt your feelings, but sometimes we come to church just to make sure we're going to be okay. We just want to come to be the hired servants. We, we just want to be okay. We just, we just want to be there to make sure. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf. This is, this is, this, when, I, when I read this version of it, this, it's really, really hit home to me. It says, and kill the calf, verse 23, and kill the calf, we have been fattening. We have been fat. We've been getting this joker fat. Because I knew we was about to have a party. I knew that you were going to leave. I knew things were going to happen and you was in a place to where you really were not going to be able to, to, to manage what I've given you. But I knew there was going to come a time to where I was going to hug your neck one more time. And because of that, because I knew that, there's been a calf that I've been put to the side and I've been getting him nice and fat. I'm getting him real big so when we have a party, we're going to feed everybody. And the Bible tells us, this, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost but now he's found. So the party began. The father knew there was going to come a time to where he was going to come back to him. And because of that, he was preparing a party in his, in his honor. He was preparing a, a celebration for the return of his son. The return of his child. You don't celebrate the hired hands when they come back. 
You don't celebrate the servants. You celebrate family. The Bible tells us in Psalms 103, 12, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. As soon as the father wrapped that robe around him, put that ring on his finger, and gave him new sandals on his feet, he began to say, you're part of the family again. I completely accept everything that you are, and you have taken your place once again in my family. He says, no matter what happened, you're not the person that went over there. I understand you made some bad decisions, but you are my child. I do not care what you've done. You've came back to me, and because you came back to me as you were when you left, You are my child and you have an inheritance and a blessing that I will give you at the proper time. It doesn't matter that you squandered the first one away. I will give it back to you abundantly, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's what God is going to do in your life. Are you willing to accept it? Are you willing? He never turned his back on his child. He never lost hope or sight of where he was. He saw him coming and he prepared for him, prepared for him to come back. He was waiting. He was willing and he is able. My last scripture. If less of you would come. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this. Then Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Are you weary? Are you starving? Have you, have you left behind the things that God has given you? Have, you? have you squandered them away? Have you wasted what God has given you? Have you done things that you are not proud of? And you say, well, God can't accept me because of this now. Well, people might not be able to accept you. People might have to fight through that. But God is going to accept you just the way that you are. He accepted you the first time. He's going to accept you again. My question to you is this. Do you know the power of your father's love? Are you running from what he's asking you to do? Have you gotten to a place to where you can no longer feel it? Have you gotten to the place where you no longer feel worthy enough to stand in his presence, but you want to be there so much? So you're willing just to be the the sideshow. You're willing to be just a person just to get a glimpse of, just to understand the excitement that's going on in the family. Are you, are, you, are you that person? But God's saying, I don't need you to stand on the sideline. I don't need you to stand up here and watch the party. Don't you understand? This party is for you. This is not their party. This is yours. You're the center of attention. This is all because you came back to me. This is yours. So I ask, are you standing on the outside just looking? Watching everybody have a good time. Man, I wish I could be part of that. Man, I'm, I just, those people are clean. Those people, they, they never left. They were, they were always there. They, they've been with my dad the whole time. They helped him. Man, I, even after everything, that I, the, a third of the state that I wasted, they built it up bigger than what it was when I left. I mean, they've been faithful. They deserve this. I'm just going to stand over here. Maybe a crumb will fall my way. See, a lot of times we try to live off crumbs. You're not going to live off a crumb. You're going to eat it. You're going to swallow it. You're going to realize that all that crumb does is give you a desire. Are you running from God? Are you running from the call that He's placed on your life? We're going to pray. And this is, this, is, this is what I want. You say, Pastor, I'm not living a life that gives God glory. I'm not living a life that is written in this book of blood. This book was sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not living my life according to the things written here because I know better. I don't know Him as Savior. I do not know Him as Lord. 
I have not felt the Father wrap his arms around me in compassion and full of love and hug my neck and kiss my face and give me a robe and put a ring on my finger as an acceptance and put sandals on my feet so I can walk. If that is you, I want to pray with you. You say, Pastor, every eye closed, every head bowed. You say, Pastor, I need to be saved. I need to ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I did it many years ago, but but, but after hearing the, your sermon, after hearing the power of a father's love, I know I am not living that life. I know that I am not. And if, and if time would end right now, I would not be able to stand in front of God. And he says, welcome in, my good and faithful servant. But he would turn me into utter darkness. I do not want to be turned from utter darkness, but I want to walk in the light and the love of Jesus Christ. I want to know what it is to live that life. That is anybody in here. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. I don't want you to worry about the person sitting beside you. Because that person sitting beside you is not going to be the one that's going to be able to answer for you. If there's anybody in the house that says, Pastor, Jacob, Jay, preacher, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I just want you to slip your hand up real quick. Anybody in the house? Now I'm going to ask this. You're saying, Pastor, I am not living like I'm supposed to. I'm not sinning, but I'm not doing what God has asked me to do. I'm on the outside of the party. I'm not using the abilities and the gifts that God has given me. And I feel like my strength is starting to to go away. My, my strength is starting to wane because I do not have the nourishment that I need. But I'm telling you, the Father is here to refresh you and to fill you back up. If that is you, I want you to stand up and I want you to come to the altar and we're going to pray. After I pray, if there's nobody here, we're going to go home. And we're going to allow you to celebrate your fathers like, like the best day of their life. Father, I love you and I thank you. I thank you for your word and I thank you for your power. Father, it makes no difference if people come to this altar. Your word has gone forth and it has penetrated hearts. And I believe, Lord God, that you're going to move upon them at the right time that they can receive you, Lord God. They might still be in an area to where they are, are, are just in a famined land and they have not yet returned back to you. But God, I pray when they do, God, that they open their hearts up to you fully and allow you to love them. Father, you put no stipulations on it. All you say is to accept. All you say is to, to allow me a place. Father, we love you and we thank you. Some people will look around and say, well, that's nobody came to the altar. It's not about that. But what it's about is when this word goes forth, it's going to cut you. Some of us might be cut so much right now, we, we don't have the strength to stand up to come to the altar because we're afraid of what God's going to do. But I'm going to pray as this word begins to cut you, you begin to understand that it's cutting you and it's cutting out things and it's beginning to heal. It's cutting out the, 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 the gross things that you have placed in your life and it's beginning to put into that healing ointment into your life. Because you might not be ready to move yet, but you will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to heal you like never before. I'm going to place my love in you and you're going to feel it like you've never felt it before. I'm going to turn this page in your life and I'm going to put more into you because that's how much you mean to me. I pray that you bless the fathers in the room today. I pray that no dad ever washes dishes on this day. In other words, take him out to eat. <laughs> take him out to eat. My wife always asks me, she says, where do you want to go eat, honey? I said, wherever you want to. This is your day. I want you happy. Because you got to understand there's anything will go in this mouth. I will eat anything. My precious Becca will not. Baby, whatever you want will go for Father's Day. But fathers, I want to tell you this. I applaud you for what you're doing. Men, I applaud you for what you're doing. 